Okay. okay, there. Talk, Stuart. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Got you. You guys are live. Good morning. Welcome to Friday, uh, Finance Fridays. Uh, this is uh, George Smith Partners series on uh, on uh, real estate finance and uh, what's happening, uh, particularly now during the COVID-19 crisis and how it's affecting the real estate capital markets. Uh, I'm Gary Tenzer. I'm one of the uh, co-founding principals of George Smith Partners. Uh, with me today is uh, one of our senior vice presidents, uh, David Pascal. Hello. Uh, and uh, we have two guests with us. Uh, and I'm very, very happy to have them with us. In fact, uh, Stuart Gabriel, uh, who is the Arden Realty Chair, Professor of Finance and Director of the Richard S. Zyman Center for Real Estate at UCLA. Good morning, uh, everybody. And, uh, Morning, Stuart. And uh, uh, Stuart, uh, before I go on and introduce uh, JP, which I will in a second, that's a really long title. What is that? What is the Zyman Center? Tell us what that is, please. Uh, the Zyman Center is one of a number university-based academic uh, real estate research centers here in the U United States. You see them at uh, numerous other major universities in the country, and this is for purposes of uh, conducting research and education and policy analysis and community engagement, uh, all sorts of pedagogy across executive and student classes and the like as relates to the full spectrum of real estate related activities from the capital markets to the real side of the economy to policy and the like. Thank you. Um, I, I appreciate you joining us today, Stuart. Um, also, uh, we have with us uh, J.P. Conklin, who's founder and president of Pensford. Uh, J.P., tell us about uh, Pensford. Yeah, good morning. Thank you for having me. I think for the rest of this, I will just be known as the guy who was not the professor. Um, I uh, own and operate Pensford, which is an interest rate advisory firm. So we specialize in things like interest rate swaps, caps and defeasances. And we've been around for 11 years now. And prior to that, I spent my career working on a swap desk for a couple of major banks. Thanks for having me this morning. So you've been Thanks. through some, uh, some rough markets before and give us some insight on this one. Yeah, I distinctly remember 2008. Great. Um, before we get into um, some of the economic um, issues and the more of the macroeconomic issues, I'd, I'd like to ask David, since uh, our business, for those of you who aren't, uh, those of you that are familiar with George Smith Partners and those of you who are not, uh, our business is placing uh, real estate capital debt and equity for our clients. Uh, we did uh, in, in, the, in the prior year, in 2019, we did about uh, $3.5 billion worth of placements and over 200 transactions. Uh, but uh, I think there's a misconception that the mark is dead. Uh, it's... Uh, got some issues and it's difficult right now. Uh, a lot of things are in flux, but we are continuing to close transactions and deals are getting done and e lenders are actually look still looking at deals. Uh, I'd like David uh, to give us a quick update on the different types of lenders, different classes of lenders and how they're reacting um, to changes in the market and, uh, and how, uh, uh, and, and just give us a quick uh, overview. So David, Hello. Thanks. It. Thanks, Gary. Uh, you know, as you know, we're in the business of, of uh, soliciting capital for our borrower clients. And uh, we are still in that business and rapidly surveying uh, the situation amongst all the types of lenders. Uh, a, a general overview is uh, the banks, several banks are still lending. The banks are much better capitalized this time than before in the financial crisis. They're well reserved, thanks to Dodd Frank and ten years of of reserving, and we're seeing banks, you know, lend that are some are some of them are taking a sixty day pause, and some of them are actively lending, and we're seeing fifty five to sixty percent LTV apartments, office, and industrial are favored. Retail is challenged. Hotel financing is not really in the cards right now. Uh, we're seeing interesting structures involving interest reserves, uh, recourse, and, or a good balance sheet from the sponsor is very prevalent. 
and rates anywhere from the 4.5 to five and a quarter, five and a half range. Uh, rates have completely uh, dis disentangled themselves from the treasury. It's now basically a coupon. So we're seeing, you know, mid-sized banks being a little more active than the large money center banks, to be honest. Uh, debt funds, many are on the sidelines right now, the bridge lenders, because of their CLO action, CLO uh, execution, or their reliance on, on swap lines or repo lines from the major banks. And we're going to get into that a little bit later on, and, and uh, especially uh, JP, that's uh, that's your area, and we'll, we'll dig into that some more too. Uh, life companies, to... life companies have money to lend, and they've uh, drastically expanded, you know, uh, heightened their spreads, and they are now again uh, dis you know disengaged from the treasury and quoting uh, rates anywhere from four and a half to five and a half percent. They're basically at 50, 55% LTV, 10% debt yields, but are actively lending and looking, looking for business. Uh, many of them, many of the large ones, they are you know, concentrating on apartments and grocery and drug and industrial. Again, regular retail and hotel is very challenged right now. Uh, the reason their spreads are high is not just purely of them acting in a vacuum and something JP and Stuart will talk about later is that they uh, price off of their alternative investment, which is investment grade corporate debt. Which, and those spreads have widened dramatically and what is and isn't investment grade is also changing daily. And we'll talk about that a little more, but this is, uh, you know, the, the, the spread increases are a lot of have to do with their alternative investments. Like I say, it's not occurring in a vacuum. Fannie and Freddie, as they have in all the other crises, whether it's 07, 08, 1998, 1999, Asian debt crisis, uh, or the after 9-11, they are actively apping deals, closing and rate locking. Spreads have been volatile. They've come in dramatically since the Fed announced the QE uh, and buying a lot of MBS debt. We're seeing, you know, general rates for full loans anywhere from three and a half to four percent with some IO. We're seeing uh, some interest reserves being funded at closing, so a little bit more structure. They've tightened up some of their underwriting uh, you know, uh, stru structures to be, you know, instead of maybe a 125 DCR, we're now at a 130, a 135. But, you know, that is a federally backed mortgage business and there are still buyers. Uh, and on the private money rescue capital, some, you know, we're seeing specialty lenders rush in to uh, fill the void, maybe at a little bit higher rates. These are unlevered funds that are lending uh, in a distressed market. And we have been approached by several of our regular lenders reminding us that they are in business right now. Uh, and they of course are, as everyone else is, favoring the apartments, industrial and office, as opposed to retail and hotel, but they are lending at all stacks. And I would also close by saying we're seeing some development deals, some you know, lenders talking about future development, construction, you know, when we do get on the other side of things, you know, projects that are one, two years out are still being discussed, even if they can't be priced right now. Great, thank you. Um, let's, uh, let's talk about um, where we are in the world. So um, uh, I'm gonna open it up to, to both uh, Stuart and JP. Oh, and I'll start with Stuart. Why? Please tell us uh, if from 30,000 feet, 40,000 feet, please, where do you think we are in the general economy um, and, um, and the real estate economy? And I, I, know it's a, I know it's a pretty broad question, but you've got the floor. Well, thank you, Gary, and thank you, David, and good to be with you, JP, and good morning, everybody. And I certainly hope that 
everybody is safe and doing well and please stay that way. Uh, certainly it's a difficult day in New York City and our hearts and prayers go out to everybody in New York. For sure. uh, let me uh, let me just say a few words of overview. The uh, you know we have numerous cycles that are in, intertwined at the moment. Uh, we have, of course, uh, a global pandemic that relates to the virus. We have a derivative economic cycle, and we have a huge band of uncertainty and some dimension of fear that pertain to the cycles and virus and economic activity. Now, this. Uh, downturn that we're currently experiencing is like none other that any of us have experienced in our lives. Uh, it's fair to call it unprecedented in the sense that it is a deliberate closing of the U.S. economy in order to preserve human life. And again, the example of uh, concern therein being in New York City and even today. Uh, so that this is not a slow slide into recession. This is taking an economy which was going full speed and essentially turning it off. Uh, highly deliberate. Uh, the question is not the uh, rate of contraction in economic activity because we know that that is immediate and widespread, but rather the rate of recovery. And I think the best way to address that question is to suggest that, again, there's wide uncertainty here, and the uncertainty is driven by the virus, and the rate of economic recovery will be driven by our success at social distancing, at our success in uh, medication uh, uh, development, and all the rest, as will allow for some perhaps risk-based reopening of the economy at some point. Uh, those of you who are listening out there hear about the economy in funny letters. These letters are V and U, where V is a sharp downturn and then a sharp rebound. U is a sharp downturn. We bump along the bottom for a while, and then we turn up. And again, it's unclear which letter, if either of these letters is applicable at this time. So uh, let me say a few things about what we know, and I'll say a few things about what we are projecting based on projections that come from UCLA and from what's called the UCLA Anderson forecast. Uh, what we know, of course, is that uh, the vast uh, number of sectors in the U.S. economy are currently shuttered. Uh, we've turned off international trade. We've turned off retail sales. We've turned off a lot of manufacturing. We've turned off a lot of consumer spending. We've turned off auto sales. We've largely turned off home sales. We've turned off major sectors of the US economy. And we have an indicator that comes from the Institute of Supply Management, uh, indicator of the health of the manufacturing sector. And as of this week, the manufacturing sector is in recession. Now we have what is reportedly an important piece of information today in the unemployment rate and the unemployment rate went up to 4.4%. And it went up to 4.4% from a, a rate in the high 3% range. You may look at that number and you, you might say, well, what's the problem? That, that by a historical perspective is, continues to be a strong number. And the answer there is that the number is a misrepresentation of what's going on in labor markets and should not be taken with any degree of seriousness in terms of what actually is going on in labor markets today. Uh, let, me, let me say why. Uh, the first is that uh, the number is based on surveys that were undertaken in the middle of March, whereas the e economy was increasingly and importantly shut down in the latter half of March. So that when we see revisions to the unemployment rate uh, for March in coming months, it will show a much uh, greater drop in the unemployment rate. Uh, beyond that, we have declines in labor force participation. The unemployment rate is a very partial indicator of the health of the labor market because you either have to, you, you, to be in the labor force, you have to be employed or actively looking for employment. And it, only those who are actively looking for employment are reflected in the unemployment rate. Okay. Not to get too technical here, here's the bottom line. The bottom line is that we've lost 
10 million jobs in the last two weeks. The bottom line is that when the unemployment rate catches up with recent events, the unemployment rate will be in excess of what we saw in the Great uh, Recession of the early 2000s, which was 10%. It may move up into the range of what we saw in the 1930s in the Great Depression, which was 25%, and it could even exceed that number in the short term. So we're talking about very severe contraction in labor markets. And again, this is not a usual slide into unemployment. This is a deliberate closing of labor markets in order to enforce social distancing and to save lives. Now, you ask based on that, what might be the path of GDP overall? And here's a thought, and this thought comes with a wide band of uncertainty, and the thought comes from the UCLA Anderson forecast. The idea is that the first quarter of the year, January, February, March, uh, will show some decline. It may show a decline in the range of four or five percent, which is a big number for a decline. But bear in mind that the first two months of the first quarter were relatively healthy months. So again, that GDP number compiled over the first quarter will not show the severity of the decline. The severity of the decline will come in the current quarter, the second quarter, April, May, June. And in this quarter, we could see a decline in real GDP of something on order of magnitude of 20%. Goldman Sachs has told us it could be 33%. These are numbers that jump off the page. These are numbers that any living economist has never seen. And uh, these are numbers that are great cause for concern. But again, the question isn't just Q2, when we've seen a deliberate closing of the economy. The question is, how and when do we restart the economy? Whether we're going to look for a V or a U or something different, and what the rest of the year will look like. Here's the hope. The hope is that uh, we flatten the curve. We have initial indications here in California that we were having some success at flattening the curve. We hope that those indications of success are evidenced elsewhere as, as well. We hope that by sometime in late May or early June, we're gonna be able to gradually unlock the economy. There are new plans in place to unlock the economy that are risk-based, where lower risk populations are liberated first and encouraged to get back to work. We see some partial rebound in the economy. And the hope, if we can manage the virus, is that the second half of 2020 looks a lot better than the second quarter, which would mean overall for the year, we would see maybe, maybe some downturn, but not nearly at the gravity of downturn that we would see in the second quarter. So broadly speaking, if you ask about the contour of the virus or the contour of the economy, the hope is severity now moving to a better outcome in the second half of the year. Gary, I could go on and keep talking. As you know, my profession is one that encourages uh, long presentations, but perhaps I should stop here, get JP into the conversation, and then we can take it up in Q&A. I have a feeling, Stuart, if you're willing, we're gonna ask you to come back in, um, in uh... You know, and others, you know, in the future, and update us because uh, we're going to. I think this is going to go on for a while. Uh, this isn't going to be fixed overnight. Um, JP, um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, thank you for having me, and thank you for Dr. Gabriel's initial thoughts. Um, far more well thought out than mine will be today. Um, I do see a lot of similarities with 2008 to Dr. Gabriel's point. It's unprecedented. That's what this feels like. This is unprecedented. There is no um, track record for us to figure out a roadmap of recovery from here. Um, I also think that the thing that reminds me of 2008 is how dramatically different the world feels on a daily basis. Each day is something that is totally uh, unique. Um, back in 2008, I can remember going into work on, on a Monday onto the trading floor and by that weekend, we were out of business and Wachovia ceased to exist as, a, as an entity. Um, and so it only took a couple of days for that to happen. Um, this year, I was in Phoenix, I think three weeks ago um, for meetings. And I can remember shaking somebody's hand at the end of that meeting. I remember wondering, am I supposed to be doing this right now? Um, 
fast forward three weeks, I've been living out of the house for three weeks and I would never think to shake someone's hand right now. So things are changing very dramatically. Um, I would say some of the, the differences, uh, number one, to David's point, the banks are much better capitalized. You know, I was part of the, the banks that went under, so I know how that went and how quickly that went. Banks are much better shaped today than they were in 2008, thanks in large part to Dodd-Frank. Number two, and this is really unique, is we almost have this inverted timeline relative to 2008. In 2008, we started pulling this thread, and we were never really sure when the thread was going to end. And so the further out we looked, the more uncertain we were about our outlook. Today, it's the opposite. The further out we look, the more confident we feel that we will have some sort of resolution, likely through a vaccine. It's the near term that has all the uncertainty. So it's that inversion of the timeline that I find unique in this environment. Um, I think that the response time from the federal government and the Federal Reserve has been driven this time in part from the lessons learned of 2008. If you go back to the financial crisis, it took 18 months for the Fed to cut interest rates to zero and for us to pass $3 trillion of stimulus. This time around, it took two weeks. And that's not a coincidence. They learned their lessons and they figured if it's going to uh, require us going all in, let's do it now instead of dragging this out. Um, to Dr. Gabriel's point, one of the big differences is demand. This is a demand shock. All demand has ceased to exist. In 2008, that took a while. It took a while for this nebulous securitization bubble to burst and then work its way down to Main Street. Today, it's the opposite. Main Street just lost jobs. They lost 10 million jobs in the last two weeks. Nobody cares about paying for anything right now except for food and medicine. For all the landlords on this call, they're probably learning that shelter is not considered a necessity when the entire world stops paying its bills and evictions uh, are not allowed to be carried out. So with 10 million Americans losing their jobs in the last two weeks and millions more um, looking ahead, I think April is going to be a very bad month. Uh, it'll be not just bad for the economic data, but for the headlines, as Dr. Gabriel pointed out about New York, this is only getting worse and it's terrible to hear about this every single day. We have a lot of colleagues that we work with in New York and you can hear the fear in their voice when you talk to them. Um, it is very, very real for anybody who is dealing with that right now. And so my suspicion is that this is not going to be short-lived. Um, we are flattening the curve. It is having successes. But I worry that the minute we start to um, unquarantine ourselves, we expose ourselves to another wave. And it just starts the process all over again. To me, this is really about um, finding a vaccine. The, the real ultimate conclusion to this is we no longer fear coronavirus. That's when we see a recovery. If we want a V-shaped recovery, it will come because we no longer fear coronavirus, not because we're able to gradually work our way back in and the economy just magically back, opens back up. I think what we will experience, just like we did in 2008, was there will be a severe psychological impact on our economic behaviors for the foreseeable future, between now and let's just call it when we get a vaccine. If we all who are probably working under stay-at-home orders today suddenly had those lifted tonight, how many of us are running out this weekend to spend money? Probably no one, right? Who is going to spend money a month from now? Probably no one. It, that is not going to be what makes us start spending money again, which is really what we need to jumpstart the economy. Um, so that fear is what is going to hold back a recovery. And the only way that we can get past that fear, in my estimation, is a vaccine. Um, I also have some opinions on how fear might be causing us to respond to this current data. Um, just like it did in 2008. And I worry that we might be setting into motion economic decisions based on data that ultimately proves to have been overstated. And I recognize that this is a very delicate topic in this environment. We are dealing with human life. But I think it's also important that we combine the data from economic experts with the data from medical experts. Because I think there's a chance that the Dr. Fauci's of the world are making decisions that just are intended to save every human life as they are supposed to do. It's our job to say, thank you, Dr. Fauci. I am now going to solicit input from my economic experts, incorporate that into your guidance, and I will make a decision that is best for the country moving forward. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Gary and David. Yeah, who makes that decision? That's, that's, the, that's, uh, that's the tough part for society to make, right? Agreed. Uh, how, do you, how do you balance uh, life and the economy? Uh, the trade-off. 
Um, so um, let me uh, let's let's turn back to uh, some uh, some uh, other issues. Um, so the the, um, the Fed has been engaging some some as we've been talking about some some aggressive uh, uh, monetary policy, uh, and uh, we now have a two point two uh, trillion dollar um, uh, I wouldn't call it a stimulus. It's it's um, it's sort of a support. Uh, 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 income support bill uh, that's that's now in place. Um, uh, in, in normal times, these things would be inflationary. Are, are these? Are you are you concerned? I'm, I'm giving this. I'm I'm directing this to both of you. Do you think Do you think these these uh, this these uh, these actions are inflationary? And are you concerned about inflation at this time? Uh, also, how long can the government keep supporting the economy? Uh, how much how much can the Fed do and is the Fed going to run out of money? Uh, JP, do you want to go or do you want me to take this quickly or however you, you, you can wish? Go, you can go first, sir. Um, so Gary, I, I'd say two things here. At this particular moment in time, our concern could potentially be uh, disinflationary tendencies or even deflation. I mean, bear in mind what JP just said, the, the demand side of the economy is dropping out. We, we have had great difficulty over the course of even recent years, and of course in major economies around the world in discerning any inflation. In fact, the battle has been the opposite. The battle has been with deflation. And even in the context of very strenuous efforts on the part of central banks, we haven't succeeded in bringing inflation up to the level that was deemed appropriate by major central banks, something like a 2% inflationary speed limit. So personally, if you ask me today, uh, the concern is not with inflation. Now, yes, we're gonna blow up government budgetary deficits. The current US deficit is on order of magnitude of four and a half percent. The current debt to GDP ratio in the United States is about 110%. Those aren't particularly good numbers, and they're gonna get a lot larger. Uh, we're also gonna see a Federal Reserve, even at a zero interest rate, lower bound, which is gonna extend almost unlimited quantities of liquidity and has the capacity to extend liquidity through, through a variety of different special facilities, uh, through lending out of its discount rent window, the Federal Reserve today has become the central bank of the world as it lends to other central banks, taking U.S. government treasuries as collateral. So the Fed, you know, some people say, well, at zero interest rates, it's the Fed out of ammo. And the answer to that question is unequivocally no, in, in no way, shape, or form, because of the clear ability and necessity of the Federal Reserve right now to provide liquidity. Is this gonna be inflationary? Uh, that's not our concern, really, in any sort of immediate sense. In fact, if we saw a bit of inflation today, it would be a good sign, it would be a sign that there is some uh, emergence of demand pressure or whatever, and certainly we can, we can deal with that inflation should it come to it, but, but today, uh, we have this combination of fiscal and monetary policy, which is aimed uh, not so much at this moment at restarting the economy, because it's premature to restart the economy. Right now, we are dampening the economy again purposely in order to dampen the virus, to flatten the curve. But the monetary policy today is intended, as I think David said and JP said, to preserve the capital markets, to preserve the liquidity in the crankcase. Think about the Federal Reserve as the oil in the crankcase in your car. The pistons can't fire, the engine can't run without liquidity. And the Fed, the Fed has just taken the U.S. economy into Diffie Loop and is pouring tons of liquidity into the crankcase. When we start the car, the engine's going to be able to run. So I just... Again, uh, I haven't been brief here, Gary, and I'm sorry about that. But no, the, answer, okay. the answer is no. We're not overly concerned about inflation now. Uh, we, we'd even welcome a bit of it. 
We'll deal with it when we see it. And for the moment, this preservation of liquidity in the financial markets, the pres preservation of the capital markets for when we do start the car, coupled with uh, the immensity of fiscal policy that we're seeing is really the order of the day. Okay, JD, do you, do you uh, have a different, different view of it? No, I, I agree with everything you said, so I won't repeat it. Um, mm -hmm. But what I'll just add is, um, sometimes I hear concerns about what this means long term for, let's say, the viability of the U.S. dollar as the reserve currency, or will we see inflation uh, as you know, some other central banks start selling treasuries? And I would remind people that the United States was downgraded. We lost our AAA rating in 2011, and our yields went down because if the United States is getting downgraded and we're the strongest country in the world, what does that mean for everyone else? And so the same is true today. If, if we are going through a troubling time, it's worse for everybody else than it is for us, and therefore we are still the world's mattress. That's not going to change anytime soon. And the only way I really see that happening, if there is some sort of shock to our ability to repay our debt. Um, and so if this were something that were impacting the United States alone, I could see there being some cause for concern about yields rising. That's not the case. The entire globe is dealing with this. We will continue to be the world's mattress. And inflation is something we would love to be talking about having an issue of three years from now. And I suspect we won't be. But there is no inflation on the horizon anytime soon. Hey, JP, right. I'm going to ask you another question. And I've actually seen some, uh, it, some questions in the chat room about this. Uh, why don't you talk about LIBOR and maybe a little bit about why the LIBOR went up what a euro dollar is and and why LIBOR is now disengaged from the overnight rate. Sure. So LIBOR is an unsecured borrowing rate between banks. And so in 2008, it was really supposed to be capturing the risk of a bank like Wachovia uh, relative to a more safe bank, let's say like Wells Fargo. And so Wachovia's rate should have been higher. The number we sent in should have been higher. Um, in today's market, it's really just unsecured lending between banks. And what we're seeing in, in today's environment in the banks is they remember 2008 and banks like Wachovia who experienced a run on the bank had a lot of dollars flow out of their balance sheet in a very short amount of time. So this time around, they remembered and they said, I'm not sending those dollars out. So if another bank were to come and solicit a loan the, the other bank says, I'm not giving you anything. I don't care what interest rate you pay me. It doesn't matter if it's 25 basis points or 50 basis points or 75 basis points. I need this cash because I'm expecting people to come calling on it. So what we've seen is this real distinct dollar shortage in the market. And that has caused things like LIBOR and anything else related to it to spike as opposed to falling like it normally would. Mm -hmm. And that's why you're seeing the presumptive replacement for LIBOR, SOFR, which is a repo rate, collapsed to 0, point or 0 0.1 basis point because the Fed is pumping a trillion dollars into the repo market every single day. And so it's two distinct animals in this environment because to Dr. Gabriel's point, the Fed is injecting one with liquidity and the other one is a shortage of dollars. And so I don't think we will see that dollar shortage um, take care of itself for probably a couple months. So if you have LIBOR-based debt, it's probably going to stay elevated relative to Fed funds for the next couple months at least. Yeah, let me, let me just add one or two comments there. Uh, any, any of these uh, debt yields, of course, are a combination of two factors, a risk-free rate and a risk premium. Uh, JP has talked and has great expertise in the area of risk-free rates, whereas David, you started the, the show today, so to speak, by talking about risk premium. Uh, we, we have an enormous capacity in, in essence, as we've talked about, an unlimited capacity to drive the treasury yield curve to something close to flat and flat at a level, roughly speaking, of zero. And the Fed, in addition to that, as we've talked about, has undertaken a variety of, it's, it's taken every page, as JP said, out of its 2008 playbook and implemented it uh, immediately and even more. And, and not only uh, the even more part, the even more part in the sense that the Fed will be lending uh, directly 
to the private sector, even more in the sense that the Fed is lending to foreign central banks, even more in the sense that the Fed is uh, developing new facilities together with the Treasury to push liquidity out there. So the Fed, in this sense, has tremendous firepower, so to speak. The issue is, in part, what David started with early on, and those are the risk premium across sectors. And here, we see variability in outcome. Some sectors where the premium have ballooned, ballooned out, other sectors where they've narrowed. There was an initial ballooning in uh, residential mortgages and in MBS, which has come back in, particularly in terms of you know, uh, all of the GSE and FHA VA backed securities and all the rest. But we, we will see some variable results there. Uh, the bottom line is that um, uh, we're doing our best to manage the interest rate risk as part of an activity to uh, preserve the capital markets. So this morning um, in uh, commercial mortgage alert, there's a discussion about uh, uh, TALF um, being extended into the, um, uh, to create some liquidity into the MBS markets. Uh, you think that'll- uh, Into the CMBS markets. C CMBS markets, is that gonna make a difference, you think? Uh, I, I would believe so. I, I believe that that's extremely important. It was the TALF, and uh, this is a term auction loan facility. This was a facility put into place by the Fed in 2008, 2009. It's just come back. It's for newly originated uh, securities and to provide liquidity for these capital markets to continue to function in terms of a whole range of asset backed securities. So it includes uh, securities that are backed by credit cards or securities that are backed by auto loans or this whole range of securities. And what Gary's just referring to is the fact that we've also included uh, securities backed by commercial mortgages, uh, what we call CMBS, uh, into the facility. And my sense, and let's let JP opine here as well, but my sense is that that was a very important move. Yeah, we, uh, this is immensely important. Uh, and just in layperson terms, essentially the federal government is saying, you can go create debt, securitize debt, we'll be the buyer. Mm -hmm. And if you are an originator and you know that the federal government will buy the paper that you're printing, then you will continue <clears throat> to do so. If the federal government, if the Federal Reserve had not stepped in and, and basically substituted as demand, then we would see a downward spiral in all pricing. And securitization, which totally froze up in 2008 and 2009, would freeze up again today. And nobody would be able to issue any type of securitized debt because they're not sure who the ultimate buyer would be. So this was immensely important in keeping liquidity. And it's not just for the big capital market players. This funnels down to things like auto loans, credit card debt, student loans. So this is immensely important for all the mechanisms in the United States economy. And I would add that uh, right now, the Fed is considering buying corporate bonds where there is a what is being referred to as the triple B cliff, where there are about a trillion dollars of loans out to companies and and these companies are being downgraded, their bond yields are spiking. This is affecting insurance company spreads and CMBS spreads. So the, the, the government starting to get into car loans, um, house loans and corporate debt is just, and CMBS is critical. CMBS is what all the bridge lenders and construction lenders underwrite to uh, as far as you know renovation and construction loans. It's the backstop fixed rate, best leverage loan for all. By buying these private label securitizations. Let's 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 focus in on um, we'll talk about real estate. So I, I guess I've been I've been doing this business now for over forty years, and I've never been so focused and aware on the interrelationship and interdependence of 
of uh, the different aspects of, of contractual relationships of the parties and uh, how money flows through real estate. It's, it's been there, it's been in front of me the whole time, but it, it's just been sort of assumed that things would work. And, and here's what I'm talking about. You have a tenant, the tenant pays the rent, the landlord pays the debt service, the, the lender pays the bondholders, and, the, and everything works. Obviously, there's times when there's disruption in that, but I've never seen a time where everything seems to fall apart at the same time. Uh, and, and that's apparently what's happening now. We have uh, the, the, uh, we have the uh, municipalities or, or states or, or regional areas where they say you don't have to pay your rent and no, you can't evict your tenant. Uh, you have um, uh, landlords uh, and property owners who can't pay their mortgage payments and uh, they're trying to uh, work out forbearance agreements with the lenders. Uh, the lenders are saying, uh, no, thank you. We're not gonna uh, do that. We're not gonna waive any rights. Uh, the bondholders are entitled to a uh, certain yield and they have certain requirements and indentures. Um, how do we, um, how does this get worked out? And where, and if the government can help here, where's the right place to, where, where should the government be pro uh, providing help? Should it be doing rent subsidy? Uh, should it be providing debt service subsidy? Wh how, what's the, what would be the right pub public policy here? So I think that, this is going to evolve over time. And we are starting in a place of, you know, what I commonly hear is 90 days worth of forbearance. And let's just all huddle up again 90 days from now. Um, when the federal government sends checks to every American citizen um, or provides sort of these uh, SBA loans to small businesses, it's a, it's a version of helicopter money, which uh, Milton Friedman popularized by saying, if we just drop $1,000 out of the helicopter, you pick it up, you're probably going to go spend it. Um, that assumes that we're working in a normal environment, which we clearly are not. If somebody dropped $1,000 into my driveway right now, I probably don't go spend it on something. Um, so I think what we will see is over the next 90 days, a lot of parties working together to try to just get through it. Um, where we will go from there is more interesting to me is how do the bondholders get made whole in that scenario? Because they did not buy a bond expecting to have this stitch in time where they were just going to suddenly miss out three months of payments. Uh, and it's not the same as a default, which they probably priced in when they bought it um, based on the credit rating. So I could see a scenario where there is more helicopter money being made available at some point where the, where the Fed realizes there's a breakdown in that chain that you just laid out, Gary. Um, and the Fed says, we now have to go and just drop helicopter money into that one chain of events to make sure that the money keeps flowing and exchanging hands. So where does the helicopter drop the money? Well, I think today where you're seeing is they're dropping the money in the tenant's hands. Um, where we go three months from now, I don't know. They may have to, to change tactics. Um, I think that there is some scenario where the federal government starts subsidizing bond payments at some point in 2020, um, just to make sure that bondholders feel whole. Um, so that they don't feel like they're taking a loss on an investment that they made. Um, and maybe it's not as direct as just simply making those payments, that debt service directly. Maybe it's, there's an accounting treatment that they can do um, that allows them to, you know, in effect, create uh, a coupon. But I think that they will be tackling that at some point over the, the next sort of three to six months. JP, do you see uh, this is extending to the CLO market? Uh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely right absolutely yeah the, all of these are very interwoven and the fed learned its lesson from 2008 and said we are not going to allow illiquidity to cause the next great depression we may have to shut the economy down for three months while we try to cut the head off this snake but liquidity is not going to be the issue and we are just going to keep finding the next chain in the link that breaks and we're gonna address that. So uh, let me uh, jump in here as well, perhaps for a minute and with full appreciation of uh, the importance of JP's remarks. Uh, I'd start with the idea of helicopter money here. And the whole, whole purpose of this helicopter money is to reach the most vulnerable, to assure that the most vulnerable have food on their table. And uh, additionally, with the hope that there would be some what we economists call multiplier effects associated with this uh, 
$1,200 payment. In other words, for a very large segment of the US population, that $1,200 is gonna be spent immediately, even in the abeyance of uh, a rental payment, that, that money is gonna be spent on food. And that money is gonna be spent on medicine and things that are needed to survive. So there's deep, deep, in my opinion, importance to that helicopter money. And in the absence of that helicopter money, we might see a, a shredding or the tearing of a social fabric in this country that could be more than a little bit concerning. So I think that the helicopter money is going to the right sector at, at, at the right time. Uh, that's the first comment. The second comment is that anything approaching kind of normal function of real estate markets with respect to eviction and foreclosure at this moment would be the wrong thing. Uh, it's, even, it's literally unimaginable in a period in which we're trying to control uh, uh, a virus for which there is no treatment that we'd be evicting people from their residence at a time when we're literally trying to flatten this curve. So, so one can't contemplate, even from a public health perspective, evictions, nor can one contemplate foreclosure. And that's part of what JP and I think David are referring to as just the first sort of first start at a, at, at a response. Now, obviously, uh, as we begin to uh, create uh, some sort of uh, moratoria, so to speak, on foreclosure, and by the way, we have uh, moratoria right now on both residential and on commercial evictions of tenants in many parts of the country. And we also have in many parts of the country, certainly with respect to any mortgages that are backed by Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac or the FHA or the VA, we have up to 12 months in uh, deferral of payment. Now, by the way, none of this eviction moratoria or foreclosure moratoria has said, oh, you don't have to pay back the money that you owe. There's not one instance of that. The only thing that's being suggested right now is that these payments can be deferred. We'll deal with the other part of it perhaps further down the line. But I do wanna say that there is some research uh, that we've done recently at UCLA that is suggestive of the fact that, and, and again, this research was done for the period of the financial crisis here in California, not for the period of the current crisis, but I, th I think it continues to have relevance. But if you have a choice between foreclosing on a residential uh, uh, property owner or, or uh, engaging in some moratoria on foreclosure, that is waiting and not foreclosing, that you would, uh, be, you would much prefer to do the latter. And in fact, the state of California put a moratoria on foreclosure during the period of the financial crisis. And it turned out that in the research we did, this was very helpful. Why was it helpful? It, it stopped fire sales of property at bottom basement prices as oftentimes emanate from foreclosure that in turn impaired the balance sheets of financial institutions and drove financial institutions out of business because of the magnitude of foreclosure. It stopped the foreclosure contagion. It sort of froze things into place and it allowed for some period for the economy to recover, at which point you would see some recovery in property values, some recovery in losses, some maintenance of liquidity in the banking sector, some maintenance of, uh, of retail demand and all the rest. So foreclosure moratoria in sort of a short term, uh, we would look on based on our research as being positive. But, so all of that are, are parts of an answer to Gary, but they don't get at Gary's full question, which is, Gary's question is a question about plumbing. It's a question about the full depth of the capital markets and what happens when you stop payments at, at the retail stage, what happens to uh, the debt holder, uh, what happens to the financial institution, what happens to the bondholder in the case of what we call our secondary mortgage markets, our asset-backed security markets, those that hold the uh, RMBS or residential mortgage-backed securities, 
the commercial mortgage-backed securities or whatever. So the answer to those questions, Gary, is we're not really sure at this moment. And it goes back to what JP said. Maybe by three months from now, we'll figure some of that out. The TALF is not relevant to your question, as I understand it, because the TALF is about newly originated debt. The TALF is about allowing those markets to continue to function going forward. It's not about what happens to impaired debt. And debt is going to be impaired. And security holders are going to be hurt. There's no way for the federal government to ameliorate uh, this pain across the board. Uh, the federal government simply does not have the capacity to do that. So this pandemic uh, is hurting many, many of us in many, many different ways and will continue to do so. Uh, that said, there are more things we can do, more things that we're doing right now. So David brought up early on the fact that today, commercial mortgage-backed securities are gonna be put into town. That's gonna be helpful. We have another big problem on the residential side that has to do with what we call mortgage servicers. Those that collect mortgage payments and pass them on to, uh, to investment banks who in turn pass them on to bondholders, the holders of mortgage-backed securities and the like. And here, we have, a, we have a really big situation on our hands because uh, uh, mortgage payments uh, in many cases are not gonna be forthcoming. The servicers themselves may be impaired to the point that their survival is problematical. This could deeply uh, adversely affect the fun functioning of residential mortgage markets. It could increase the cost of residential mortgages, exactly the opposite of what the Fed is uh, looking for by increasing risk premium uh, over those risk-free rates. Uh, that the Fed is pushing down. Uh, it could change the whole system of mortgage lending and push it backwards as opposed to forwards. But here again, we have hope. The hope is that uh, this issue of uh, mortgage servicing rights and the plight of mortgage servicers has been raised to the level of the Treasury and the Fed. We have some hope on the basis of ongoing conversations that the Fed, with some funding from the Treasury, will create a new facility that will uh, allow the mortgage servicers in the residential mortgage business to survive. So, uh, or the Fed will do something different with this so that we're, we're working on it. We're working on it as it's evolving. We're looking to plug these holes in the dike. Again, the bottom line is not that some people won't be hurt. The bottom line is that liquidity will continue to flow and with that flow of liquidity, uh, the economy will be able to uh, function. Uh, I'll close on this particular point with just one small note. Uh, Benjamin Bernanke, who was, you know, by all accounts, a spectacular chairman of the Federal Reserve during the period of the financial crisis, did seminal academic research uh, during his days at Princeton prior to becoming a public service about the role of capital markets in uh, accelerating real side economic activity, something that we called in the economics nomenclature the accelerator. The bottom line here is that uh, there is no question that without the liquidity in the capital markets, the real economy would suffer much more egregious losses. And so what you all are doing at GSP Partners what JP is doing in his work, this is vital, vital, vital to uh, our economic recovery. Thank you. <clears throat> um, my, uh, we have just a few minutes left. I, I, I'd like to just talk about the future um, for a minute um, or two and get both of your take on, once this is over, what do you think real estate's gonna look like? Uh, what, do you th what do you think people are going to, my sense is that people are going to want to want to use real estate in a different way and live in a different way. What, what are your thoughts? And maybe this isn't even an economic question. Yeah, I, I think that it's natural to just assume that we will go back to the way it has been. But I think that would be a little naive. I think this will be such a dramatic shift. 
uh, that it's tough to predict what it's going to look like when we get on the other side. Um, it's not as if we suddenly go back out to all of these retail shops or restaurants and bars that have closed and who could not get through and reopen just because they were given um, some SBA money, that suddenly everything returns to normal. Um, so I don't have a good sense of what this is gonna look like because um, this is totally unprecedented. But I do think that it will be fundamentally different. Um, and I think that we will see probably um, a totally different way to use real estate as an investment class relative to the alternatives. Uh, it, is, it has gotten to the point now with so much liquidity in the market that we got accustomed to it just, we would just sort of compare it to let's say treasuries or corporate bonds. Uh, and I think it will be a far more complex question in the future once we get on the other side of this. Mm -hmm. Stuart, what are your thoughts? Uh, no, I think uh, JP provides some very uh, sage perspective on this all. Uh, to put it in a, a bit of a more mundane sense, we're going to have competing forces in each one of these sectors that will dictate some path of recovery. On the one hand, for many of our sectors, be they hospitality, be, they, be it retail, be it trade, uh, we're going to have some pent up demand. And people are going to run back to movies and restaurants and all the rest. No one's been buying clothes. No one's been buying cars. No one, you know, there's, there's just a whole bunch of stuff going on uh, currently that is in the category of pent-up demand. Uh, that's on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, as we know, based on the unemployment data and all the rest, that incomes are spiraling down uh, wealth has spiraled down due to contraction in the stock market and elsewhere. And so the ability to effectuate that demand uh, based on income and wealth is gonna be diminished. And as JP started with saying very early in this broadcast, there's also gonna be a very different set of attitudes, uh, a very different sense of confidence, and that could certainly uh, impair effective demand as well. So hotels now are, with vacancy rates in the single digits, uh, retail malls are shuttered. Uh, uh, occupancy rates. Occupancy rates. Yeah, I'm not sure what I said, but that's what I meant. Uh, occupancy rates are single digits. Uh, um, malls are shuttered. Uh, the ports are closed. Uh, we, we're, gonna, we're gonna see uh, difficulty, as we've indicated, both in uh, the multifamily residential sector and in the single family sector. We're not really building houses at the moment, so we've turned off housing supply. Uh, that could, uh, that's gonna be turned on big time when this thing is over. On the other hand, housing demand is gonna be damped, perhaps for some of the reasons that I indicated. Uh, the fundamentals will return with some, uh, some period of time. And uh, I don't think we should be pessimistic, but I think that we should be realistic uh, that there is disruption and that this disruption will have a, a tail on it. All right, great. Um, do you have any, uh, any further thoughts, David? Uh, yes, uh, I do. I mean, I think I just wanted to share an anecdote, like it, real estate may, may change, this may change real estate forever in certain ways. I spoke to a developer yesterday and, and his equity partner up in Sacramento they're building an office building and they've, they've now changed the entire design. All the handles will be made out of a special copper alloy that doesn't, where the virus can't live on it and they will build the building as it will be virus free every night due to sanitizing measures and special metal that they're using. So you could see this as being like a new lead certification type of thing where, uh, you know, and it will it affect co-living, co-working. I mean, obviously the jury is still out. I'd also like to mention that anyone who wants to be on the future webinars or watch future webinars, go to www.gspartners.com, sign up for our weekly newsletter, FinFAX, and all these webinars invitations will flow from there. And, and I write a column every week and, and uh, in fact, is a uh, go-to source for capital markets info in our business. And our next, uh, I, I believe our next um, 
uh, webinar, uh, which will be on the topic of uh, life insurance uh, company financing, uh, is scheduled uh, in two weeks from today, which I believe is the 16th or 17th. Um, and uh, it is the 17th at uh, 10 a.m. And you'll all be getting um, email invitations for that. So I'd like to uh, just take an opportunity again to thank uh, JP and to thank Stuart. Uh, your contributions today have been fantastic. Really do appreciate your insights. It's been, I'm sure everybody in the audience appreciates it. Uh, my partners and uh, my associates at uh, GSP clearly appreciate it. And um, uh, thank you so much. Um, and I hope we can call on you again in maybe uh, a month or so and get an update. Thank, thank you. you, guys. Stay safe. All right. You too. Thank you all Stay very safe. much. Bye-bye. Thank you.